Uh, one, we limit this spin to roughly 0.2 uh, in either direction, up or down. So this is a very uh, fairly strict limit on the spin, which already uh, tells us something about where these black holes may have uh, not been um, uh, created for example. Now, what could be the origin of this? Uh, and again, actually, another <coughs> thing that we have with this uh, so-called eccentricity, the uh, two black holes may not necessarily be orbiting uh, on a circular orbit, there may be some eccentricity. Now, this eccentricity is uh, basically lost very quickly after a binary sport uh, through gravitational waves. So unless the two black holes were um, basically uh, randomly colliding, there should be a very uh, low eccentricity uh, because the binary had time to evolve for a long time. We can limit the eccentricity so that favors scenarios in which the black hole binary existed for quite a while. So what can be the origin of these two black holes? How can we put these two black holes together that eventually will merge? There are two major directions, two major possibilities. One of them is that, again, we have two massive stars. Uh, both stars went through stellar evolution and uh, ended up um, either blowing up as a supernova or just collapsing into a black hole. But basically, the two black holes could come from two massive stars, which are in binaries. Now, just for the record, uh, massive stars are well, they love to be in couples. They're, most of the massive stars are not by themselves. So um, this scenario is uh, fairly, fairly common, actually. Our sun is very small. It doesn't like to be in couples. OK, so uh, the other possibility is if you look at uh, different uh, nuclei of various galaxies, you guys probably know that there is um, a very massive, so-called supermassive black hole expected in uh, uh, galactic centers. And around this supermassive black hole, we expect a population of smaller, tiny black holes. Ten black holes like to be uh, together, so they kind of move uh, to the center. It's a mass segregation effect. And in this environment, where we have lots of black holes together, there is a uh, uh, possibility for chance encounter, <coughs> in which case, when the two binaries, when the two black holes get close enough to each other, they get into a binary through, again, losing their um, energy through uh, gravitational that's not a possibility to form a binary and end up with what we have. Now, the other thing is uh, this 30 solar masses we have for the two black holes. Now, it sounds like, I don't know if it sounds like a lot or not a lot, but it is a lot, actually. So people were not expecting to see uh, this large black hole. We know about supermassive black holes that, again, are millions to billions uh, times <coughs> heavier than our sun. But um, below that, um, we weren't necessarily expecting um, very large black holes like this. The black holes we knew about uh, indirectly were smaller. So this is actually uh, bigger than what we saw uh, before in this sense. The fact that they could grow, grow this big and we saw this very big black holes can actually put a limit on, solar met on the metallicity of the environment in which this uh, two black holes were formed. It turns out that if we have a massive star <coughs> that can eventually become a black hole, if the star has a lot of metall metallicity, it will have an easier time losing its matter. It's going to get smaller, and it's not going to produce such a big black hole. <coughs> so just for the fact that our black holes have roughly 30 solar masses, we can actually put a limit, again, on the environment where these two black holes were formed. What else can we do? Again, um, the fact that we didn't have any eccentricity uh, can tell us something about when these two black holes are formed, again, when a star collapses, uh, very often they can have a so-called natal kick. They can start off with a high velocity of hundreds of kilometers per second, very high velocities from the birth of the black holes. And this is limited by the fact that the spins of the black holes we observe are not large in uh, any direction. And again, just one last thing that uh, we know about the black holes. So again, uh, this kind of eccentric encounters in galactic nuclei are also disfavored by the lack of the <coughs> observed. So there's many limits we can say uh, for this particular binary, just from these informations we recovered from the gravitational wave signal. We can do other, uh, other limits as well. So again, uh, besides astrophysics, as I mentioned, uh, fundamental physics is also something that one can achieve potentially with, um, with uh, binary black holes. So again, uh, black holes can test, for example, uh, general relativity in a, a strong uh, gravity regime, and there are many, many other possibilities. So we have a separate article on this uh, that we could do with this particular event that can get much better uh, with uh, future detections. Now, a few things that we can do. Uh, for example, we can look at this waveform, and we can uh, try to recover information about the two black holes from the part which is the spiral or the part which uh, has to do something with its final black hole. And we can look at whether these two measurements are consistent 
with each other with general relativity. We find that they actually are. So, um, so far, so good. Uh, no, uh, no difference. Another thing, maybe, we can put limits on the mass of the graviton from dispersion measures of the signal. So there are different fundamental limits one can do. Um, but then again, what, what we did so far, what we did with one, this one specific event, um, are very limited, and there are many possibilities if you guys are interested. Now, besides just looking at this one event, one very uh, major effort within LIGO, or with LIGO basically, is not just to look for gravitational waves, but look for uh, other messengers that may be coming with gravitational waves, along with gravitational waves. So there have been uh, more than 70 observatories, different kinds of observatories, that were uh, working together with LIGO and Virgo to follow up uh, gravitational wave transients and try to find other electromagnetic counterparts that come with these events. Now, for two black holes, this is probably less expected, but this is a major effort that, again, can be very interesting, for example, for binary neutron star mergers. So again, there have been many follow-ups, and uh, if you look at the archive, there are already uh, many cases. Maybe let me just mention two uh, swift uh, follow-up our events and uh, found nothing, unfortunately. And Fermi, uh, two uh, gamma ray satellites, uh, Fermi may have found something actually. So um, we'll see uh, what happens with uh, this one so far. And again, uh, we can look, for example, for high energy neutrinos as well. Uh, so uh, Ice Cube and Ontario, the two major uh, high energy neutrino detectors, were also participating in these follow up efforts. And uh, we did find three neutrinos that were temporally coincident with this event, but not um, otherwise unfortunate. And uh, Sabi will say a few words about the future. Again, just the one thing I want to emphasize, if you look at um, the next few years, so again, uh, we had a limited sensitivity compared to where we're going to be within three years, and we had a very limited uh, time frame. We only observed things uh, for three months. So um, if I multiply uh, what we had currently say, uh, one uh, event that the expected value uh, by four, which is how much longer we're gonna observe, per year, right, this first observation was three months, I multiply this by uh, four, and I multiply this by three cubed, which is the volume, um, that's a lot of uh, events. So um, look forward to more of these. So um, uh, this is not the last time you hear about these effects. And Safi, I think I'll pass it back to you to say something about the future. Yes, so I have to agree in the future. Uh, my dream is to see many black hole binaries. Uh, I would like to see systems where black holes are eating up uh, neutron stars, you know, just, just crunching on them, and when the neutron stars are, are merging and forming black holes, uh, exploding stars like supernova. But I would like to put up a couple of uh, interesting uh, possibilities, um, because it's a big amount of space, yeah, the little not in the middle with initial LIGO. A huge, uh, huge violet portion is is open LIGO. Yeah, so I see great future in uh, multi messenger astronomy. Yeah, because if we really see the, the light, the neutrinos, the gamma rays, the X rays, the gravitational waves together, that's the real puzzle. That is how we gonna learn about cosmos. How we put together the puzzle that makes us stay. So. This is an example of uh, a graduate student uh, mentored by uh, the group, uh, Maria Carisi. Uh, she actually made uh, many interesting papers. I show here the first comprehensive study of uh, uh, gamma ray precursors. Uh, gamma rays and <coughs> gravitational waves can go hand in hand. So I have a bet on we can find uh, uh, gamma rays and gravitational waves together. And she's also working on supermassive black holes to call for the paper and uh, uh, something. And uh, the other very interesting thing for me is <coughs> really, do you hear that? Yeah. yeah. So, man, they are not circular. Black holes can be really cool. Imagine that, that these eccentric orbits around each other. <coughs> it's really a different gravitational wave. Like a yeah. So that's that's all. And of course, I'm looking forward to the global gravitational wave network. No. Uh, oh, <laughs> yeah. <Emotions. laughs> so the global gravitational wave network, and I think I think that is really the future. And uh, and uh, I would like to have a. Uh, Messi, 
page. The future is always important, and the online or there will be other observatories. Uh, we had a study, and I think the best place is Australia. And it's nice, and I like Australia. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I would like to emphasize that um, I think morally we have such great experience as scientists making things happen. Um, we are working on something else, not just gravitational waves. We invest some part of our time uh, in global health to help people with our experience. And I think that's very important if you have a great idea. Uh, go out and solve some problem which was unsolved. Maybe your viewpoint will make a difference. Sometimes it does. It did for us. So um, I think it is very important. And now I would like to thank the Vanderbilt University faculty. I had a tremendous time here. My colleagues here were great. I'm still writing papers with my friends who I made here. We just have an AES Nova publication with Tracy Huard, astronomer, and uh, I think I think the department is recruiting excellent, excellent early career scientists and young people and professors. So. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for allowing me to make this discovery. Vanderbilt had a part in it. And Steve Chorna, the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful advisor who allowed me to get here.
if it emits gravitational waves, it's not a sure, we, we know for sure that not every supernova will emit gravitational waves. Okay, so uh, one, two, three, is that okay? Yeah. Um, you guys moved really fast through this, and I'm just an unfrozen caveman, so I'm going to ask something very basic. Um, how analogous are gravity waves to just electromagnetic radiation waves? Is it like, you know, like wave particle duality and relationship between energy and wavelength? And is, are gravity waves just a very low frequency electromagnetic wave? You can think it's obvious. Because yeah, I saw yeah. like red shift up there and then just nine, yeah. So, 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 so no, it, they are, they are uh, very different than, than uh, what you are thinking about. Yeah, when you are thinking about electromagnetic waves, uh -huh. you are thinking about dipole waves. Yeah. So uh, you can really, really do this in the electromagnetic field. Yeah. <coughs> but when you are emitting gravitational waves, what you would see is really a shape deformation. It's really a quadrupole wave. Yeah. So what you would see me getting taller and thinner, and then wider and shorter. Sound waves uh, propagating the jello, yeah, uh, with this shape deformation as, as, as it propagates, yeah. So, in a sense, you would, you would, you would better think about this as, 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 as a seismic or sound wave which goes through. More like a, a, a wave in a medium as opposed yes. to like a magnet. Yes, yes. Okay. So, if you, if you imagine, you know, space time like this funny crystal you know, having this sound wave, that's not such a bad